was cracking big dogs. Welcome to the new HQ. I was about to say welcome bike to the HQ, but we're in a new location, so get used to it. I know there's not a lot of decorations here and whatnot. We're still sprucing up the place. I've only been in here for a couple of days. So that being said, I've been itching to get y'all some content out. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs got to eat BDGE fantasy football. Today we're diving into 2019 fantasy football running back rankings. So we're looking at rankings for running backs for next fantasy football season, but we're going to chop this up a little bit because I did my top 12 like a month and a half or two months ago. We want to revisit that. We want to update that. There's obviously been a lot of moves around the NFL, free agency, all this kind of stuff. Um, so we're going to recap that. And since I am still in the process of moving, I'm a little bit time capped uh, working on the draft guide and all those things. So we're going to split this up into two parts. We're going to go with the top six today, seven through 12 next week. So as always, if you enjoy the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new. Let me know if you agree or disagree with any of my rankings thus far as we go through. Let me know what y'all want to see in the HQ. It's very bare bones right now. If there's some decorations you want to see. If there's, let me know about the noise too, because my window's right here. Uh, we get a lot of trucks and stuff going by, but the mic's here, so I don't know if you pick that up at all. If any suggestions is... Mucho apreciado, baby. Now that I live in Brooklyn, it's a prereq that I learned how to speak Spanish. So without further ado, I need to get my energy up. Let me drink a little bit of coffee. Let's fucking go. All right, so first up on our 2019 fantasy football running back rankings is still Saquon Barkley. I don't care all the moves that happened in here. He was running back one on my previous list. So I'm going to tell you where each guy was in the previous list and then tell you where he is now. RB1, Saquon, Baquan has not moved yet, um, but there were a lot of moves this offseason. Odell Beckham, of course, moves over to Cleveland. They get Kevin Zaitler. Golden Tate also moves to New York. So we move one wide receiver but we bring another one in we shore up that offensive line a little bit the problem at qb obviously still remains the nfl draft is later this month which myself snacks and animal will be attending so check out gofundme.com slash big dogs draft if you want to help the cause if you want to see us produce a lot of mayhem down in nashville we don't know what the giants are going to do right they have the sixth pick they have the 17th pick are they going to take a quarterback with all the reports and rumors thus far it seems Highly unlikely that they take Haskins at six. No one ever knows what the fuck's going to happen with the NFL draft. I hope they take DK Metcalf just so we can get Snacks' reaction on live video. That would be literally the best piece of content that's been on YouTube over the last six years. But the question uh, with OBJ is, does this hurt Saquon Barkley? Your initial reaction would be two-sided. It's, yes, it hurts him because all the attention is going to go on to Barkley, which is probably true. But at the same time, the touches are probably going to rise for Saquon Barkley, if that's possible. So looking at these splits last year, we have 12 games in which he played with OBJ, and we have four games in which he did not. If you're looking at you know a bird's eye view, if you just look at the numbers real quickly, you're seeing that Barkley was averaging almost three and a half to four fantasy points more, half PPR, with OBJ on the field. But if you actually you know get down to the grit of the numbers, you really have to look at these things in, in context. Was Barkley actually worse? without Beckham. Without Beckham on the field, he actually averaged more rushing yards, more rushing attempts, and the exact identical target numbers. So the same exact target totals. The volume was unchanged, whether or not OBJ was on the field uh, with Saquon Barkley. The difference came in receptions per game, right? You see that column where it was 6.17 receptions per game with OBJ, 4.25 without OBJ. What does that mean? To me, that has, that has nothing to do, that's not a volume issue, that's not an efficiency issue, that's an Eli Manning issue. It's very likely that in that small four-game sample size, a few of those passes were poorly thrown by Eli, Eli Manning, which would, of course, skew a sample size that's coming from only four games. So the rushing yards are up, the rushing numbers are up, the rushing touchdowns are up, the targets are the exact same. So before you go out and judge and say, oh, he averaged four points less per game without OBJ, it's literally just a factor of his reception totals being a little bit different when the target totals are still exactly the same. So when it comes to Barkley, I'm still completely fine with him at the 101. He's the most talented talented running back in the NFL. I don't think it's close. If you all are going to argue with me in the comment section, go do that, please. Actually, it helps my YouTube algorithm, how, whatever the 
I don't, I don't know. Go, go comment something down below. Tell me how about how Todd Gurley is as good as Saquon Barkley because you're going to lose that argument. So look at these things in context. Uh, adding Zietler to the mix is obviously a big boost because the inside of the line is the most important part of an offensive line when it comes to the running back and the running games. Zietler was uh, PFF's sixth highest graded guard in the entire NFL last year. And like I said, that's the most crucial position when it comes to the running back. They need to shore up that inside part of the line. Uh, with OBJ gone, I really think Barkley has a very, very good shot to smash Christian McCaffrey's record that he set last year only of 104 running back receptions in a season. So he's my number one. Number two, Zeke Elliott, Dallas Cowboys. He was my RB3 in the last video. He's now my RB2. And uh, one other thing, guys. So I'm going to be doing this in two parts, right? One through six and then seven through 12. But I'm also going to give you access to my top 25 running backs for free. Uh, in standard and half PPR and full PPR. It's literally just going to be the link down below um, in the description. I'll put it in the comment section as well. So if you want to just skip all the analysis, which I don't suggest you do that because we're bringing y'all the biggest fire facts only. Big facts only here. <coughs> I'm still at the HQ. Listen, you can take me out the HQ, but you can't take the HQ out your boy. That being said, you can get my top 25 running back rankings right now for free. Just go down below. It's the first link in the description. It'll take you to a page. You just got to enter your name or whatever, um, and then you'll be able to see it. It's half PPR, standard, full PPR. It's all there for you. Grab that at any time as you please. So Gurley was my number two, and I'll get into Gurley, why he's not my top three. If, if any of you guys missed a, a video that I did with Dr. Jesse Morse, I will break that down. He won't be until part two of the running back ranking series. So... Gurley being a fade in the first round, Zeke moves up to number two, and I think it's you know kind of just by default. If you look at these splits, what the team did and what Zeke did after acquiring, acquiring <coughs> still dumbass stuttering no matter which HQ you put me in, after acquiring Amari Cooper, it was like a complete 180 degree spin, right? He was doing circles, similar to me after uh, dollar marks at Applebee's. Seven without Cooper, eight with Cooper. Cooper. This is from weeks one to eight and then weeks nine through the rest of the season. Literally six points more per game, half PPR in fantasy. Six and a half receptions per game compared to three and a half uh, receiving touchdowns went up by about a tenth. Targets were almost two and a half more targets per game, more receiving yards, more rushing attempts, just more everything on that list. The offense absolutely transformed uh, as did Zeke's production. And when we actually break it down, right, starting in week 10, Zeke caught at least five passes in every regular season game from that point on. I'm going to read you off his reception total starting in week 10 at Philadelphia. Six catches, seven catches, five catches, six catches, 12 catches, seven catches, five catches. And he didn't play in week 17. I'm sure he would have been just as involved in the offense. So that's the big change here when you're looking at a guy like Zeke. It's like, do you think he is as involved in the receiving game? I personally don't think he's going to come near that like 75 catch total that he had last year. Um, I think with their offensive linemen coming back, which I'll get into in a second, they're going to re rely heavily on the ground game again. And when they are in the passing game, they're going to look to develop more of Michael Gallup on the outside. You know, you have Jason Witten coming back, which I don't really give a shit about Jason Witten. He's not going to do anything, but he will be a red zone target. So if anything, maybe that takes away two or three goal line carries from Zeke. Um, and I do think they're going to draft a weapon in the draft as well. So I don't see Zeke being as involved in the receiving game, but it was good to see after a lot of lackluster years that he does have the capability of really being a big piece of that game. Um, and over the last eight games of the season, he was averaging a ridiculous 150 yards from scrimmage per game. If you pace out his second half of the season numbers to a full 16 games, I don't like taking small sample sizes and pacing them out, but I would say half the season is a good enough sample size to really understand what that offense was doing. If you pace out his second half numbers, you're getting 104 receptions, 2,416 total yards, 10 total touchdowns, 354.2 total half PPR fantasy points. What is that noise? Man, there's always trucks going around this mother budget. The other thing to take into consideration for Zeke is the offensive line. Like I said, they've had elite run blocking for basically the pinnacle years of his beginning NFL career, but there was major health concerns last year. They had all pro guard Zach Martin miss some games and dealing with the lingering injury. Uh, Travis Frederick, arguably the league's best center, missed all of 2018. He is supposed to be back and ready for this offseason, um, which is actually pretty surprising, but, but we'll see. We'll have to take that with a same, uh, grain of salt. His backup, Travis Frederick's backup, Joe Looney, was the 32nd graded center per PFF last year. So that was a huge hit, obviously. Um, the O-line still finished as Football Outsiders' 8th best run blocking line, 13th best in PFF. Frederick is reportedly um, expected to be ready for OTAs, like I said. So 
you know, this this line, if healthy, is going to be very, very good, if not elite, again, for C, uh, for Zeke. Getting ahead of myself there. C-Mac, number three, Christian McCaffrey, Carolina Panthers. I also want to say that uh, I know a lot of you guys purchased my draft guide, and there have been a, uh, some technical difficulties, and I'm filming this on, I believe it's Wednesday right now. So by the time you're seeing this on Friday, hopefully they're all shored up. But I promise you, I've been working with Wix, the software that's housing my draft guide, nonstop for the last couple of days trying to figure this out. This is it's one of those like you all ever dealt with customer service and you're trying to figure something out and you wait on you wait on the fucking line for like 45 minutes just for them to tell you that they're going to transfer you up the line. And then once you wait for another 20 minutes, then you have to re-explain the situation, even though they told you that they wrote all the notes. And that's what I did with Wix like three or four separate times in the last couple of days. I finally get to like the last person up and they're like, oh, well, we can't find anything wrong. We're going to have to, we're going to have to escalate this to, to the upper tech team or whatever. So I really apologize for any of you guys that um, have been dying to get into the draft guide. I've been dying to give it to you. So I promise you it's still going to be a very good product when this is all said and done. Just some few tech issues. Thankfully, none of you guys have your rookie drafts, of course, yet. If you do, if you purchase the guide and you have your rookie draft, you know, within the next couple weeks um, and the, the guide is not working, I expect it to be working by this weekend. You can obviously personally reach out to me on Twitter, on Instagram, DMs, any of those things. And I, will, I try to um, answer as many people's personal questions as possible. So um, if you have not caught the draft guide, bigdogsdraftguide.com, you can get the season long one still on pre-order price. The rookie dynasty one is already live. Uh, the season long one includes my top 250 big board rankings, all of my positional rankings by tiers. It's like 70, 80 running backs, all of my dynasty rankings, my top sleepers, my top busts, my must own players, all tons of uh, exclusive articles that you guys are very, very, very much going to enjoy. I promise you it's the best money you're going to spend on fantasy football this offseason. But let's talk some more free content. Christian McCaffrey is my RB3, was my RB4 the last time we did this. No difference here for C-Mac. The offensive line pieces have shifted a bit. Um, their longtime center, Ryan Khalil, is expected to retire, but they signed Matt Paradis to a three-year, $27 million contract, which shores up that, that spot that they would be missing. Um, he's coming off a broken fibula, but he's expected to be fine for 2019. They released Matt Khalil, which, you know, they got a lot of Khalil action going on here, but they re-signed Daryl Williams after an injury play 2018, so I think the offensive line is, is going to be fine. Like I said, they're shifting pieces, but overall, they should be about the same talent level. C-Mac is as solid as they come in anything PPR formatted. Uh, and even if they do bring in a running back via the NFL draft, I don't think they signed. Maybe I'm maybe I'm missing. Maybe I forgot. Let me check real quick for y'all um, to make sure that it is still C-Mac's backfield. I know they've talked about wanting to lower his workload, but he's still going to hit 300 touches, and he's still going to catch 80 balls at, at a minimum. So um, I do expect them to draft someone. I think they could draft someone like Mike Weber. Uh, from Ohio State and I think that would be an interesting fit because he is a bigger back and he does have some explosion and and some good traits to him so we'll we'll see what happens there but <clears throat> um, for right now we'll expect C-Mac to be the absolute dog there so he is my number three can't argue if you wanted to boost him up if it's full PPR I'd probably take him over Zeke and I think you could argue him up there with Barkley as well move on to number four Alvin Kamara of the New Orleans Saints he was the running back five last time now he's the running back four. If y'all are enjoying the video so far, make sure that you please hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're going to be breaking down everything with the big facts from here through your fantasy season. Also, if you're on iTunes, guys, uh, if you listen via podcast, uh, just uh, subscribing and a rating or review takes you 10 seconds maybe. So that would also be appreciated. Alvin Kamara, also not much change here. Marketing Groom has officially moved over to Baltimore. They bring in his basically identical replacement in terms of Latavius Murray, inking him to a four-year, $14.4 million contract. Now, um, when I mean identical replacement, obviously there are different players in terms of what they bring to the field, but they will probably, uh, Murray will likely occupy pretty much the same exact role that Ingram is. And I would argue that Murray is a better fit for this offense, actually. The one concern, of course, is Kamara's splits, right? Over the first four games of the season, he was an absolute monster. Over the last 11, those numbers dipped down both from a production and a volume standpoint. And I think um, on the left side is probably similar numbers to what we can expect for Kamara in 2019. The, the blistering pace that he began the year with, it was never going to hold steady, right? He was never going to get 25 touches a game. But, I mean, looking at the left side, 17.5 PPR fantasy points per game uh, and over a touchdown per game, fine by me. Plus, he has that weekly three-touchdown ceiling that just wins you 
Um, it just wins you your week. So like while Kamara, <coughs> Kamara might be a little less exciting for some people just because he's not going to be getting that 25 touch workload, I don't think you should have ever expected him to. Still in an elite offense, an elite offensive line. I love that Matt Kelly keeps comparing the New Orleans the dome to like the Coors Field of baseball. Because it's like if you're a home run hitter and you go to Coors Field, same thing with being an explosive running back in the Saints dome. Max Unger, <coughs> excuse me, their center randomly retired like last week or two weeks ago, but they signed offensive guard Nick Easton, formerly of the Vikings, to a four-year, $24 million contract. So there's really no loss there. The offensive line is still amongst the elite. I need some water. Moving into number five, Melvin Gordon of the Los Angeles Chargers was running back six, now running back five. Speaking of elite, man, all of these guys are elite. Gordon is absolutely amongst the elite fantasy running backs when he can stay healthy. I know we're fading that term, if he's healthy, if he's healthy. So it's not like Gordon is constantly hurt, but he has a small string of getting hurt in each of his NFL seasons. He'd be up there in the one-on-one discussion if he could stay on the field for 16 games or even 15 games. But he has missed multiple games in the majority of his NFL seasons. He's missed at least two games in three or four seasons, but never more than four. So it's not like he's someone who is like Leonard Fournette who misses like eight games sometimes or more than that. Last year, he averaged 20 and a half fantasy points per game, half PPR, which was running back three on a fantasy points per game basis behind only Todd Gurley, Saquon Barkley. So you get the small injury discount, but you get the high elite level production when he is on the field. Now, I talked with, like I said, Dr. Jesse Morse a couple weeks ago. If you missed that episode, it's probably one of the most valuable episodes I'm going to be putting up on my channel. I will link it up there as well as down in the description. And if you happen to just want to go through the rest of this video, just go on my channel and type in, uh, just type in like injuries or something and you'll be able to find it. So I interviewed Dr. Jesse Morse, who works with a lot of athletic and professional teams and he said there's no worry about Gordon's injury outlook in 2019 any more so than it was any other year, which is not high. Uh, looking at sports injury predictor, has him slated to miss one and a half to two games. If that's the case, I will gladly take 20 to 21 fantasy points per game in 14 games. So Melvin Gordon, you get the elite production at a small, small, small discount down at like the five or six range. He is my number five. Number six, man, this is uh, this will probably trigger a few people. I mean, there's Todd Gurley, of course. There's Joe Mixon. There's Le'Veon Bell. Damian Williams. Now we know that he's the guy. Number six, I went with... Drummle. Dalvin Cook of the Minnesota Vikings. Running back 13 last time I made this video. Clearly, uh, I've gotten pretty high on the man. He is now my running back six, and he has cracked the top six of my 2019 fantasy football running back rankings. Had the, had the I got to plug that for SEO purposes. I also need, if you guys comment, the more y'all comment, the better YouTube is like, yo, this dude, Nick, is throwing out fucking big facts left and right. Let's keep showing it to people. So more people come, more people like it, and more people subscribe. I grow bigger, and then I can get on a bigger platform and give you more videos and get higher quality production. See, it's all a circle. It's a circle of life. All you got to do is comment, and everything gets better. Every part of life gets better for both you and me. So go fucking drop a comment yelling at me how mad you are that Dalvin Cook is my number six. Running back, I'm all in on Cook in 2019. Another player that Dr. Jesse Morse said he has absolutely no concerns from an injury standpoint. You know, he missed a lot of time with that hamstring injury that he kind of re-injured multiple times throughout the year, and it made him miss a lot of games. The torn ACL he had is two years removed at this point, so the likelihood of re-tearing either that knee or the other knee is uh, virtually gone at this point. The hamstring is fluky, of course. For a guy like Leonard Fournette, it is not fluky because Dr. Jesse Morris told us that Leonard Fournette's ankles, the injuries that he has occurred through college and the beginning of his NFL career, those ankle injuries that he has had have actually been deteriorating the strength of his ankles, which is what causes all those other injuries. But for Dalvin Cook, he does not have those concerns. The biggest concern here for me, of course, is their offensive line. Nick Easton signed with New Orleans, like I said, to kind of replace losing Unger there. So they need to address the interior of their offensive line in the draft. But when I look at what's in store for this Vikings team in 2019, I imagine Cook is going to see 20 touches a game almost uh, as a lock. And he's not just the guy getting 20 touches. Cook is, you know, electric and ridiculously talented. And this offense wants to run the ball, right? You had last year's interim offensive coordinator, Kevin Stefanski, for the final, I believe, three games, right? He took over as the OC, and you look at what he did over those last three games. He ran the ball on 48% of their plays under the Stefanskinator, eighth highest rate in the NFL. On the entire season, though, 
Minnesota ran the ball on 35.5% of their plays. Only Green Bay, Pittsburgh, and Atlanta ran less. So they were not running the ball whatsoever, really. And that could have been a product of Dalvin Cook being hurt for the most, most part. But as soon as Stefanski took over, they were, they were running the ball on nearly 50% of their plays in like top eight number in the NFL. It's what he and Zimmer are going to game plan around. It's what they want to do. They want to build up that defense. They want to run with Dalvin Cook. The bigger news here, of course, is Latavius Murray is finally gone. And I'm not going to call Murray a a vulture because I think he's earned more respect than that. I think he's a very high quality NFL running back. And we're going to see that in New Orleans this year. I think he's an absolute steal and a great value in drafts. If you're getting him in best ball drafts anywhere later than like the eighth round, you're getting an absolute steal. But that's not why we're here. Murray is not there to take a lot of touches away from Cook. He caught 22 passes last year, had 140 carries. More importantly, though, he had 22 red zone carries last year. He had more uh, more 10 zone carries and more goal line carries than Dalvin Cook. Now, Cook is going to get all the early down work. He is a ridiculously good pass catching back, so he's going to play on all three downs. He caught nearly four passes a game last year in the games that he was healthy, and now he has a window into that goal line work, which I expect, although he's a small sized guy, going back to college at Florida State, he was their goal line back, and he scored a shitload of rushing touchdowns. So I think he will eventually work into that three down role, but also like the goal line and the two down, uh, the two minute passing down role, which is absolutely enormous for a featured back. That's why Dalvin Cook is a guy that you can get in the second round, but I think he's probably one of the league winning backs in the early round picks. So that opens the door for him to be the featured part of this offense. And whenever he's healthy, that's exactly what he's done. If you look back to his rookie year, I know he had four games before he tore his ACL. He was averaging over 21 touches a game, over 110 yards from scrimmage a game, and he was scoring in nearly uh, half of his games. Once he was fully healthy in 2018, you look down the stretch, He was fantasy's running back six, so exactly where I have him slotted. That's not why I fucking slotted him there. He just happened to fall into the rankings there. But he was running back six over the last five weeks of the season. Sports injury predictor, the one where you could look at what chances of a guy missing games last year, what percentage of games that he's going to miss or whatever that they predict based on a lot of algorithms and doctor working behind the scenes, has him missing a little above one game in 2019. If we get Dalvin Cook for 15 games, he's going to absolutely explode. But when you really take it into context, he appeared in 11, 11 games last year, right? One of them was week four when he played 20% of the snaps before he left with a hamstring injury. One of them was week nine, which he was coming off a four game rest, right? He, he, he missed four games and he came back week nine. He played in less than 50% of the snaps. So if we uh, exclude that week four game where he played 20% of the snaps, if we exclude week nine where he played less than 50% of the snaps because those aren't real numbers to like look at how he's going to be using the offense, his regular season average in normal games was 75%. So for using his actual role for nine games, his 16 game pace, it was only 265 touches, but it was 64 receptions, 1,400 yards from scrimmage, and 7.1 touchdowns. And that was while he was splitting time with Latavius Murray and not getting any of the goal line work. So I think he absolutely, without a doubt, cracks that 300 touch mark, 70 receptions, 1,600 yards from scrimmage, and could easily flirt with double-digit touchdowns in 2019. I just think if you're in any sort of PPR format, do not underestimate just how good this guy is in the passing game. So Dalvin Cook rounds out this top six running back list for me. And again, if you want the, the full top 25, They're in standard, they're in half PPR, they're in full PPR for you. Make sure you just go click the first link down in the description. It will take you to my website, which you can uh, get the rankings from there. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel if you're new because we're doing everything fantasy football like this throughout the offseason, into the season. And let me know what y'all think about the new HQ in terms of lighting, in terms of decoration, in terms of sound. I'm hoping that this recorded well and this came out well in terms of the actual picture itself. So uh, that's it, man. I I love y'all. If you want to see a a tour of the rest of the HQ, the the new apartment, I put out a vlog on Wednesday that is a little bit of an apartment and neighborhood tour and whatnot, causing some fucking madness and a ruckus up in here. Um, But until then, Big Dog's got to eat fantasy football. I love y'all. BigDogsDraftGuide.com. Check it out.